Hello, my jelly fighters. My name is Jim, and this is going to be a weekend brogue. Let's see if I've got this right here. Okay, this I think is a new one. 855-887-645. That's pretty close to today. That's probably right. Okay, so we'll go with this one. Uh, let's see. New game. Custom... 855-887-645. Does that look like that? That looks the same, right, as that. So we are good. So let's see what we have. Oh, is that a trick? Is that a trick broadsword? Are we in trouble? Okay, so what am I thinking about today? So it's been a while since I've just talked about something. So I'm thinking about um, doing a podcast on just a solo uh, me reading a paper podcast on the measure of the multiverse. How big is the multiverse? Now, I'm, no, I don't personally believe in anything like a multiverse. I don't think it's a very uh, scientific concept. Uh, but there are a couple of things it's supposed to answer. Right? There are a couple of things it's supposed to give you. Um, the idea of a multiverse is supposed to give you. One of these things is an explanation for the constant for the constants of nature why are the constants the constants they are now the explanation isn't uh, very great it's not one of my favorite ones it's anthropic in nature that means that the constants of nature have to be the kind of constants that would at least once allow for at least in some situation, allow for something to observe something like the constants of nature. Okay, so that's the anthropic principle. And um, it's been used once to really good effect and abused a lot after that. Um, I shouldn't say abused, but I'm, I'm not sure that any other anthropic arguments were really good. I mean, when Weinberg used it for the cosmological constant and found that the cosmological constant should be about the size it is, that was and should be considered a really um, astounding thing, right? But... That doesn't mean that, as a logical principle, it's always viable. And there are a lot of um, arguments about something called anthropic um, how should we call this? Anthropic bias, right? So uh, that I haven't looked into. I would like, actually, to Um, put some stuff together about anthropic arguments and uh, anthropic bias. And those things would um, be part of a sort of gee whiz textbook for physics, for physics for non physics majors, sort of thing. Um, physics were poets idea, but in the spirit of the age, it should in some way teach the critical thinking. So in that sense, it should probably um, have some relationship to, uh, okay, if we use this kind of thinking in physics, where is it good and when is it bad? When does the anthropic bias or when does the anthropic principle become the anthropic bias, right? I'm not at that point right now, but that's where I'd like to go. Um, but by using the anthropic principle, physicists are able to
physicists are able to um, reduce the number of different um, possibilities to um, four, not two, but four of the uh, sort of anthropic principle there. So or for the constants. So we have to have gravity that's not so strong that things like human beings would get crushed on things like the Earth, right? Uh, we have to have um, electromagnetic forces and um, strong and weak nuclear forces that are about the right size to create different kinds of um, matter. And that matter will be stable. And things like that. You have to you have to live in a spot like this. Now that itself doesn't sound too awful, right? That's not a super difficult something to um, okay I lost my place in that That's something that we know we'd like to see, right? We know we'd like to see a um, okay. I didn't realize this that the grass doesn't grow back after you throw the tunnel, or you um, not throw the tunnel, but you destroy the. stuff below, right? So that's a good thing to know. All right, so what do we have? Lightning, axe, staff of poison. Um, think of poison two is better than a lightning two. Hallucination on depth four, not too bad. Um, okay. Not a way around there, so we'll go down here. So as far as that goes, that's reasonable. It doesn't really, I don't really feel that explains the um, constants of nature. But it, it is an explanation of why we see the constants of nature we see. Just doesn't explain anything about what goes into it. So it's not really quite a physics argument, right? It's it's a bit of a um it's a bit of a way out of the 
a way around having to pull together a real argument to the physics of what ma what makes the um, constants of nature what they are, whatever they end up being. Um, the anthropic argument's trying to add a little bit more to that. And what is it adding to that? Um, Well, if you can construct a number of universes, then, oops, let's not do that. If you can create, create, construct a number of universes that would be, um, in some way, uh, in some systematic way, it's not right, is it? Should be able to get to that. Categorize the number of different ways these things are, um, the physics of that categorization. would become the physics of the constants of nature. And so that's what they're trying to do, right? They're trying to use, say, string theory, right? That's, you might have heard the term string theory landscape in the past, to do this. So why would you use string theory? Well, what <coughs> is generally considered to be a fairly major problem with string theory is that string theory um, is not unique. That is, there are many string theories. There are many theories that end up being part of a class of string theories, right, of um, similar ways of describing the universe. So if you can categorize those string theories, uh, then you can find the probabilities that different sets of um, constants, universal constants, exist in the world, right? And when you do that, you have um, you know, essentially explained well, to some extent you've explained what the constants of nature, why the constants of nature are the way they are because you've explained how to get you know, these particular string theories or the constants of nature out of the string theories. So physics of these constants of nature becomes the physics of, you know, string theory itself. So that's actually fairly good for a theory like string theory that uh, purports to be a theory of everything, right, because it's explaining, you know, everything. It's explaining even something like 
why the constants of nature are the way they are. It's not a direct explanation, really, but it is an explanation, right? So it's reasonably high up there. I wouldn't say that it's sort of the most astounding explanation. Um, and something in the statistics might make it less than fully, um, how should I say that? Less than fully um, satisfactory. It, it won't feel, I shouldn't say satisfactory, it won't feel good, right, as a theory, because uh, there's too much still at stake, right? There's still much, still too much that um, isn't explained. Why this particular universe? Why these sets of constants and so forth? But to a to a very real degree, I think um, does a pretty good job. So, um, I shouldn't say it does a pretty good job. I should say something along the lines of, I think it does a reasonably, um, a reasonably good job of, what is this? So anyways, that's more or less what I want to talk about. Another red Warhammer? What did I put here? Crap. Okay, call you a bad squirrel.
Okay, so then we get to the more interesting problem. And that problem is, well, you know, if you're going to have this multiverse, how big is it? How many multiverses are there? That seems to me to be a reasonably um, good question. And here you get to this interesting thing, which is that certainly depends on what you mean by how big. Now, um, the paper I recently read said there were about 10 to the 500. There could be 10 to the 500 of these things. Well, different ways you could theoretically build your um, multiverse. What kind of multiverses do you actually have and things like that? Fire immunity, not so interesting. And the Detect Magic Potion said there's nothing else interesting in that Warren, so having killed the dude, I'm moving. So that's one answer. Now, another answer that I got from Leonard Suskind, and you can sort of listen, you can listen to that on one of the Physics Frontiers episodes is that there's sort of a core string theories, the core of string theories, I guess is the way you'd say it. And um, that core is continuous. It's basically put together with a continuous parameter. So that in that continuous core, uh, there are a lot of possible string theories. And then towards the uh,
towards the periphery, there are a number of discrete points. Now that may be the 10 to the 500. That may be um, a sort of countable in number of infinities, right? A countable infinity that's infinity that's um, proportional to the real numbers. I don't know. I have to reread that um, paper, which is actually one of the things I'm supposed to be doing right now, or one of the things I told myself I'd be doing right now. So I want to make sure that what I read is what I read, and so forth, because, you know, I think I talked about that paper with Randy um, on Physics Frontiers a few years ago. So And the idea that <coughs> I remember everything perfectly from that time is untenable, right? So my guess is that it's highly unlikely that my memories are correct. <coughs> now, one thing I do remember is somebody um, disagreeing with Leonard Susskind about how many of these string theories there are. Now, there are different ways to do it, right? So um, one way would be just to count the number of possible string theories in a uh, star and this couple of spiders in some sort of straightforward manner. And I think this is what Suskind and this guy who was disagreeing with them were both saying is that we're just going to count the number of string theories, right? And that's going to be what we're going to use to try to figure out what's going to happen with the fundamental constants. Um, those proportions, right, the proportions of string theories with the correct um, values for the fundamental constants, those proportions are going to be our uh, we call them priors, right? Um, right so first we we'd figure out the proportions with different kinds of constants and then we figure out the likelihoods of
having um, people in each one of those situations. <coughs> and then we'll decide what to do with everything else. Right, we can use something called Bayesian or Bayes' rule, not Bayesian analysis, different things, to figure out sort of what these probabilities should be. Now, Bayes' rule is basically a way of saying, well, if I know, you know, some sort of probabilities, and I know prob some conditional probabilities, right, then I can find related conditional probabilities. I can take the conditional probabilities going one way. That would be something like I know the um, probabilities of life forming, let's say, given I know these fundamental constants, or I have these fundamental constants, then I know the probabilities of life forming versus Okay, that was, oh, I'm stuck in here. I have a life. I do, so I'm going to wait around for a while.
So then we want to um, in some way improve on that number. Right? We want to end up with something a little stronger. But you don't get to know it because I was a moron. I had a scroll of teleportation. I thought about using it, and I had a potion of life. So two nasties. Um, I was hoping the dagger or the spear would be something interesting. That did not happen. So, yeah, I should have teleported and um, gotten out of that issue out of that situation with the spider. Um, so yeah, that's just a stupid mistake. Okay, again, um, there's a lot more to that that I wanted to talk about, but I guess that'll have to wait for an actual podcast rather than me talking while I'm playing a game. So you'll have to tune in. <laughs> um whenever I actually put it out, if I do. So that's actually what I, again, that's just one of the things I was thinking about. I have to start editing the new Physics Frontiers. I wanted to do an experiment because we had a really huge increase last month in our um, downloads in the first week. It was huge. I mean, it, it was insane. Um, and in the next couple of days, I'll be able to look at the return, right? So normally, um, the first week is about two-thirds of the um, first month downloads, but looks like it's a lot less this month, or a lot more this month. So, so that first week was very weird. Um, I got some strange um, notices from the podcasting host site, the podcast host site, uh, but that sounded like it would make things be smaller. So um, the current downloads are smaller than usual for this cycle, this point in a cycle. Um, but they're, but the original ones were large, and I want to see if um, I can get a large number um, again. And if so, I might have to modify what I'm doing with Physics Frontiers. I want to do this um, other thing, too, with the weekly electronic podcast. I was talking about the uh, multiverse thing. Like I said, Randy really hates the multiverse stuff, and I only sort of hate it. But I do want to figure out how big the multiverse is. I was hoping that I could find something in the way they construct these multiverses, uh, these sets of multiverses, that could give me something rather than a countable infinity to get a... Um, uncountable infinity, but not just a regular old uncountable infinity. As far as I know, nobody has a sort of fractal infinity. and I'd like to find something like that. And this seems to be a really great place to end up with a fractal infinity in nature, don't you think? Um, anyways, have a great time. Bye now.